Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I must confess you that it is the first time that I am the first speaker in the Congress, Then it is the first time that I speak with the two microphones, uh, but it's not the first time that I talk about something whose domain, uh, who um, I'm not the main author of, in the sense that uh, my wife, Professor Sansoni, who is sitting here, is uh, the main author, the main uh, researcher, and the main scientist for all uh, 3D things that uh, you will uh, hear today. So here, the beautiful place of Brescia, and uh, you can see from uh, these buttons that uh, come into the screen uh, the uh, universe of our uh, startup companies, which can do uh, a lot of things in the, in the field of uh, optoelectronics and of imaging and also of lasers. Uh, as a matter of fact, imaging has became, become very, very popular and also 3D imaging is now becoming popular because uh, everybody uh, of us wants, uh, has or wants to have a 3D television to see with the spectacles and all these things. But uh, we have been in the business of uh, 3D imaging in the sense of uh, acquiring imaging with uh, particular instrumentation since 1990 and I was still in the concerted action where the first uh, trials with 3D imaging was. Now, uh, I'll start with, uh, well, I cover four topics as you have seen in the titles and uh, I will try to be as short as possible, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, as I said in the panel, uh, 3D and 2D images can be useful for uh, detecting in ophthalmology uh, for detecting ophthalmic pathologies, but also it can be useful for non-ophthalmic pathologies in the sense that uh, you may see that the eye is the, uh, the, window, of, uh, the window of the body and all, uh, a lot of things that can be seen in the eye can be also seen in uh, um, pathologies, non-ophthalmic pathologies. Uh, now, uh, I will start with what uh, you uh, or most of you know or have experienced at the doctor, which is the op optical coherence tomography. Optical coherence tomography is a technique that, uh, an imaging technique or a 3D imaging technique, which, which is based on interferometry, on uh, low coherence interferometry. So the eye is scanned as a section, and uh, you can see from here, you can see the uh, the macular region and the perimacular region and the, ret the inner retina, I know where all the cones and rods are. Uh, the point is that so far there are a lot of very sophisticated instruments, but most of them do not give uh, quantitative information, but only qualitative or semi-quantitative information. So uh, all the computer-generated information is... Uh, uh, to uh, help uh, to the doctor, but not uh, as, as, a, as powerful the, as a help for the doctor as it should be. And also the uh, 3D rendering, to see the uh, macular region in the green that you can see in the center of the area, is not a real quantitative information. Uh, only the retinal, uh, retinal thickness is considered to be uh, semi-quantitative. But what we really did want to see is uh, if, what, if, what, if it was possible to make a metrological, we are, so to say, metrologist, metrological approach to equip the instrument with software tools for the quantitative analysis of pathologies can be analyzed only in a qualitative way. And uh, we applied this to, together with our friends uh, in ophthalmology clinics uh, around Italy with the cases of macular holes or diabetic macular edemas or macular packers uh, to quantitatively uh, make measurements of the dimension of these holes and possibly to make follow-ups of patients in their life. Um, so we um, built some software which can be useful to quantify and to use the normal uh, um, uh, image elaboration techniques which are very common in industry to apply them to the biomedical field. So uh, I don't think, I don't know if this will work for uh, as an uh, animation. 
Probably yes. Doesn't? Doesn't seem to. Anyway, uh, I I was betting that in the in the in going from oh yes, it's uh, it's going. So uh, what uh, this uh, elaboration does, uh, what this animation does, is that uh, in our software you can uh, uh, elaborate frames, and you can see um, a follow-up of a patient from one time or period of life to another visit, and you can see how uh, the um, the packers are evolving from one uh, time to the other, and uh, here you, can, you have the elaboration of, uh, the, um, of the image. You can select different areas, and you can see how the different areas evolve in the, with time. So uh, this is one way to acti acti uh, practically quantify the information and uh, to uh, make a real follow-up of the patient with a CT which is not uh, at the time, uh, by the time being, not uh, um, easily done with the commercial instruments. Uh, we evaluated with this software three groups of patients, four patients with macular edema, eight patients with macular Parker, seven patients with macular diabetic macular edema, and uh, we made a complete follow-up of the patients, and uh, <clears throat> we made a comparison of uh, the elaborations uh, to um, verify their um, their draw, uh, their advancement with or without treatment with uh, um, in uh, uh, a quantitative way, so uh, well the experimental results with uh, uh, is with are uh, here summarized with the macular Packer, and uh, you can see that pre treatment sorry for the Italian. Uh, you can you uh, had a total area of the holes of the pucker, uh, which were uh, which were very um, uh, large, and uh, the treatment would have uh, reduced the uh, the uh, dimension of the holes in the patients. And uh, the, the uh, same thing has been done with the diabetic macular edema and uh, with the macular holes, so with a particular. Uh, emphasis to the reduction of the macular holes. So this uh, showed, uh, at least uh, demonstrated to our uh, colleagues uh, in the ophthalmology clinics, that uh, this seems work, uh, that the, uh, this approach works. So uh, we could summarize that quantitative image elaboration plus image metrology, and metrology means that uh, to make measurements on the uh, holes and on the morphology of the eyes allows the improvement of the diagnostic ability of ophthalmic instruments. So this first case is a case concerning uh, an, um, the use of, a, of an instrument to monitor an ophthalmic disease. Uh, the second case is the use of, this, of instruments like this to monitor non-optical, non or non-mainly ophthalmic diseases. That is, the evaluation of retinal arteries as a predictor of hypertension and to predict uh, early structural alteration in, in hypertensive patients. And that is a partnership with the Second Medicine and Ophthalmic Clinic in Brescia. Uh, just as a background, uh, here you have an artery. Uh, this is a cerebral artery, and uh, you have the wall, and you have the uh, um, region, the lumen, where the uh, blood flows, and uh, it seems that in hypertensive, hypertensive uh, patients, this uh, ratio from the, uh, of the lumen to, uh, divided by the whole diameter uh, is altered, and this is a marker of the sufferance and uh, is related to time to hypertension and all these things. Now, uh, so far, our partners of the medical clinic uh, we used to quantify this effect just by, uh, by uh, taking, um, taking samples of the artery, the small arteries from the back. So uh, it was not non-invasive, it was definitely invasive, so uh, the patient should be, has to be operated and an inch sized, and uh, the small arteries has to be, had to be seen at the microscope. 
and uh, they came to us asking why can't, you, can we, can't we try to uh, see if uh, looking at the small arteries in the eye could help, uh, uh, could uh, give us the same results. And uh, so we did it uh, like this. Uh, here there is a, an instrument which uh, I think our friends at Ibili uh, already know. This is the Heidelberg retinal flow meter, flow meter that measures the flow of blood in uh, the optical, uh, in the retina. And uh, this is, um, uh, unfortunately, this is no longer in production. This is expensive. And uh, um, it combines fundus camera to Doppler flow imaging to visualize in the diameter of the arteries. So we tried with these uh, in a co um, according to a study which has been in, uh, made in Heidelberg itself by a co-worker. And um, this is what our startup, Nerox, uh, uh, which is specialized in biomedical systems, has made for us. Uh, these are the images of uh, the small arteries of the retina. Uh, this is the reflection image from uh, with the instrument seen as a fundus camera. And this is the, the, uh, flow, the Doppler signal. That is, uh, uh, with this you can see the outer wall, and with this you can see the inner wall. By difference, you can see the wall diameter, wall, wall thickness, and by dividing the wall thickness to the whole, uh, overall diameter, you can see the wall to lumen ratio. And uh, so this has been quantified and uh, we made a, a number of steps of uh, experiments to, col uh, to correlate uh, in the same patients uh, the arteries taken by their, from their back to the arteries as seen in their fundus. And uh, we came out uh, to a good correlation between uh, the two cases and uh, we, co we could see a clear uh, dependence of uh, these uh, parameters, this uh, behavior in the normal and uh, in the high hypertensive uh, subjects. Now, um, as I said, uh, this uh, instrument is not uh, any more available. So, what can optics do for you? Can optics do for you? Um, now, uh, the new generation of uh, um, fundus cameras are fundus cameras correlated to, uh, with adaptive optics, so with uh, active optics which can uh, go back and forth and it is an asymmetric optic to non-aspheric non optic to uh, increase the quality of the image. Whereas in a fundus camera you wouldn't see absolutely this kind of information, this kind of walls here. Uh, the gray walls that you can see here are the walls of the, ve uh, of the vessel whereas uh, this um, darker one plus the um, bright one are the inner part of the vessel. So with uh, adaptive optics you, could see, you can see um, uh, things like this and uh, with this we repeated the um, measurements with the software um, uh, created by Nerox we uh, could see and could uh, uh, make the correl same correlation that you have seen um, before. So uh, if you think that adaptive optics can be also, it is also sold as a retrofit a module that can be combined to normal uh, fundus cameras, then you can have a, a real, uh, really interesting, a really powerful tool uh, for uh, cheap, diagnostic systems and for systems that can also be brought to the practical, the generic medical doctor to pre-screen uh, patients at risk of hypertension. Um, a brief outlook about uh, imaging in dentistry and orthodontic in partnership with our other startup uh, open technology. Now, uh, here we go to 3D imaging, the real 3D imaging in the sense that uh, now um, we have a number of tools which uh, can be either laser based, I mean laser scanners, or uh, can be uh, incoherent uh, uh, systems like uh, fringe, projector, uh, fringe projection systems to take the 3D uh, image of 
a tool. Uh, now, um, dentists are now using it uh, quite often to scan either the plaster when they have made uh, the, uh, when they have scan, put the paste on uh, in the mouth of the patient and you, they uh, scan what comes out and uh, uh, make their models like this in order to, um, to virtually put the capsules and to prepare all the material. But uh, what is important is that uh, the real um, um, picture of the 3D picture of the uh, tooth arcade, I, I, I don't know if it is the arcade, but uh, is, uh, can also be made in situ uh, just by looking, by uh, going with a, small, uh, with a small tool that makes, uh, that has intrinsically built a laser or an, uh, an incoherent light source and uh, a camera with triangulation. This is a real benefit of the fact that the cameras now can be as small as these ones. So you can put them virtually everywhere. So uh, our, the group, our friends, uh, Heusler in, uh, uh, in Erlangen, are using, uh, has patented now a system like this to go and scan the, uh, uh, the, the mouth uh, in order to go to uh, reconstruction of the tooth, modeling of the tooth, and so on. And in particular, uh, the, uh, our startup company has uh, made, uh, has patented uh, this dental tool with a structural light projection, so incoherent projection, with accuracy down to five microns and uh, repeatability down to, two, down to two microns. So this is one of the uh, goals of the, or frontiers of uh, uh, structured light projection in uh, 3D images with the scan resolution uh, of uh, 120,000 triangle for a single tooth or two million triangles for the entire plaza. Now it is, uh, uh, in, it is in, interesting how, uh, in Italy at least, there are 20 manufacturers of these kinds of uh, instruments for the uh, for a dentists, and all the scanners for all the 20 instruments but one are made by this company. So that can be one of the issue about the utility of making a startup company that can, that can find a real uh, niche of the market where to put its um, uh, system. Uh, the, other, uh, top, uh, the other key topic of uh, uh, the, uh, my lecture is imaging in prosthetic technology with the application to maxillofacial prosthesis and for uh, reverse engineering. As we said, uh, 3D imaging is not only useful because you can see things on television, on 3D television. Uh, this is the last of the problems. Um, or you can put it in virtual reality. So what we need is a real object out of what we achieve, what we acquire. So what, this is what industrial uh, people call reverse engineering or revenge. So, um, maxillofacial um, prosthetics is a uh, hard tough in the sense that post-oncological reconstruction deals with post-oncological reconstruction of maxillofacial defects. Um, tumors in the face can be very, very nasty in the sense that uh, you can uh, uh, come out without a nose or without an ear, with an ear without an eye or with a half-faced, uh, completely devastated. So it's a real psychological and economical problem which derives from the handicap. We uh, have also, the patient has real functionality problem. And in general, the surgical reconstruction is really invasive in the sense that people put their hands in the, in the holes and uh, fill it with plasters and with wax, and then the patient, the patient is really discomforted. So um, we were uh, contacted, we have been contacted by the dentist and we, by the maxillofacial uh, surgeons in our university and in other universities to 
devise a tool to uh, non-invasively assess this problem. Um, well, this is... So, uh, the aim of the work was the direct fabrication of prosthesis using 3D acquisition, reverse engineering, and rapid prototyping. And that uh, would uh, not touch the patient at all until the very last phase of, uh, of putting the prosthesis in situ. So there are two, two kinds of uh, uh, approaches. One uh, approach is when the patient has, when what you have to remove uh, is a unique part of the, of the face, and uh, such, such, such is the nose. Uh, the other one is when you, do, you can take profit of another part of the face to um, uh, be, such as the eye or the ear. Uh, so in this case, the patient had no nose, so we had to make the uh, scan of the patient with the, this system, which is a three-dimensional system, uh, with the patient put like this. So uh, here is the is the um, computer replica of the face. So we then uh, ask our secretaries to give us their noses in the sense that uh, we uh, scanned all of them and uh, we try to, uh, and we let uh, the patient choose who, uh, which nose was most suitable for her, um, her face. And uh, then we made uh, a simulation of uh, the, uh, uh, the face with the nose. And then we created two um, views, one with the nose, or the external part with the nose, and the internal part without the nose, with a hole. And uh, we made uh, two, uh, two replicas, two plastic replicas. So that's a nylon uh, uh, replica made with uh, uh, reverse engineering. Uh, it's very easy and very inexpensive to do this. You can do, you can send your model to the net and uh, the object comes out, come, uh, comes back. So what you can do then is to, you fill the hole, from the hole you can put the two masks together and you can fill the hole with, the, with wax and, uh, uh, you have the prosthesis. So the process is not the definite one because you cannot put wax on the face, but then with that thing you can remodel the, the whole thing and you can produce the final, uh, the final solution. So uh, this is the wax in, uh, uh, in place. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, the patient uh, is uh, like this in the very early uh, period and uh, then when after fixation it was like that. Also, the advantage of this technique is that when you have everything on computer, you can, um, uh, you can use the same techniques to remake the processes because the processes is not, uh, uh, it can be uh, deteriorated and it, is not, uh, it's, it doesn't uh, last forever. So from this point of view, uh, the patient's stress was nil. Uh, the procedure is very fast, uh, the repeatability was very high, and the flexibility also. Uh, the same thing has been done with uh, an ear. So in this case, the guy had uh, um, an ear. Uh, it was missing an ear because of some problems uh, when, he was very, when he was a child. So we just uh, took the uh, right ear and uh, we mirrored it and we, uh, we obtained the left ear. We modeled, we rendered, we also... Uh, took the uh, uh, shape of uh, the hole, and uh, uh, we could then make a prosthesis which could adapt to the hole with the appearance of the of the uh, uh, of the right ears. So uh, the whole thing was really fast. So the patient is now like this, and uh, the cost of the whole thing has been. Down, down to 70 euros for the whole procedure. So that can answer some of the issue concerning uh, the, decrease, uh, the decrease of cost uh, for, uh, um, uh, for health. Uh, also because, at least as I said before, in Italy uh, the health uh, system does not pay for this kind of procedures, so uh, the patient has not uh, access to um, the public funding. 
Uh, the last, I think I am quite on time, the last uh, um, part of my talk would be uh, some sort of borderline kind of uh, biomedical application of uh, imaging. Uh, but, I mean, this is uh, uh, related to forensic medicine, so forensic medicine is medicine anyway. And uh, so we had been uh, uh, involved in uh, um, forensic science and criminology together with uh, uh, the, the forensic doctor in uh, Milan, the national police, the carabinieri in uh, Italy. That is, uh, the aim is large-scale uh, large uh, scene documentation, interior documentation, wounds and scratches, metrology of corpses and autoptic room acquisition related to crime scene analysis and uh, support to the legal authority or to the judge in judging about uh, uh, the fact that someone was uh, uh, guilty or innocent. So uh, we uh, con uh, collaborate with all these uh, people and uh, here we are. So uh, the crime scene documentation is a first step in criminal investigation and it's very critical because if something is lost or damaged, subsequent steps are compromised. A number of trials have been contaminated by the fact that the crime, scene and crime scenes had not been uh, properly investigated. So uh, after that you couldn't do anything. But anything. So the standard documentation of this crime scene is doing photographically. Now we want it to um, end is basically bidimensional. So it, if it is bidimensional, you just miss one coordinate, and this one more coordinate could give you some more ideas of what is going on, is going on or has gone on. Uh, so the aim of our work in this case was to assess the feasibility of using the third dimension to increase the information about. Uh, the uh, crime scenes before the removal of the objects and of the corpse. Um, we have acqui acquired large scenes in order to put cadavers or false cadavers or real cadavers in uh, the proper place and to simulate bullets coming from an office in order to make ballistic studies concerning the possibility that one uh, one bullet could uh, have come from one or two or, or another direction. So uh, this is our campus and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, my wife's office and uh, we have, uh, oops, pardon me, so we have put a mannequin here and uh, with a total station with a large 3D system we could uh, reconstruct uh, both uh, the campus and the office uh, in order to see whether uh, the uh, hypothesis that the bullet could have started from the office of my wife uh, could be sustainable. So the, uh, to do this, it, it's not uh, peanuts, uh, in the sense that you need a couple of instruments at least, one large scale instrument with low resolution and one a, s a small scale instrument uh, with high resolution to uh, have all the details of the body. So uh, at the end uh, uh, we could reconstruct the whole uh, scene and uh, here are three po possible trajectories of bullets and uh, um, to see how um, uh, the, um, uh, the murder could uh, have taken. So here you can see that from uh, this point of view from here uh, there was at least one trajectory where it was not possible to hit the target because there was a wall. So uh, that uh, is just a, a hint to say that with three dimension you just can infer uh, the pos possible, the possible um, origin of a murder better than two dimension. Um, the sensor that you have been seen before for the, uh, for the lady uh, he has been also um, uh, used to uh, monitor uh, wounds, to monitor scratches. It has been, um, it has been calibrated against the very small scratches in, in order to see whether, whether it was sensitive enough to detect scratches. Or, uh, um, so here are the scratches that are uh, very, uh, very well visible. 
Uh, then uh, um, uh, we wanted to know if uh, the uh, system could be good enough also to, uh, to make uh, a nice color rendering uh, that is uh, uh, blood plus bones plus uh, um, uh, just to describe in a better way the thorax region in uh, cadavers. And uh, also we wanted to see um, acquisition of decomposed corpses in the sense that decomposed corpses are quite uh, uh, noisy in the sense of uh, colors and all these things. And uh, nevertheless, uh, the um, uh, system could perform very well in order to describe it. So uh, we also wanted to compare laser and non-laser uh, uh, 3D imaging because as you, most of you who are experts in lasers know lasers has speckles and speckle is uh, very characteristic of laser light but also is very noisy when measure metrology has to, uh, is concerned. So we compared uh, uh, with uh, compared the same wound, uh, it was a baby wound um, a baby cadaver wound, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, lasers, laser uh, scanner, which is the gray one, and uh, the non-laser scanner, which is the green one. And uh, we definitely see that the, uh, in some occasion, non-laser illumination is much superior than laser illumination. Um, we collaborated with the police in order to make uh, a simulated uh, indoor uh, crime scene analysis with uh, the cadaver there. And uh, you can see where that comparing uh, the larger scale analysis with the cadaver positioned here and uh, the small scene analysis, uh, small scale uh, scene analysis, uh, you can see uh, blood, um, uh, blood stains or you can see part, uh, particulars of, uh, or details, small details of the scene. So everything after the, you have uh, done all these things, uh, the scene should be, could be free to be um, emptied and to be evacuated and all the information in three dimensions should be there. Also we have done uh, uh, real scene analysis because we had been uh, um, uh, called for a mafia murder, a, a skeleton of a mafia, uh, mafia killed, the person was discovered. And uh, uh, when you go there, uh, the, so the um, un environmental situation can be very nasty. A lot of people around uh, are uh, very nasty condition with sun and shadows. And since we are in optical uh, in the optical domain, uh, the system should be as robust as possible with reference to the environmental situation. And uh, here you can see the, two, the uh, 2D photographs, and here you can see the 3D reconstruction and the detail of the, um, of the, uh, scale, of the skull. And I think here is the entering place for uh, the killing bullet. And uh, so me where metrology comes from, now uh, the, uh, the lawyers that are uh, they, they are in the, in the court cannot uh, um, infer false data from uh, uh, 2D pictures. Now we have all the numbers that can characterize these kinds of findings. Uh, also, we can uh, uh, obtain uh, um, measurements in, uh, uh, quite nicely in the case of carbonized bodies. I mean, when people are burned, because uh, we can uh, model carbonized body by suckling carbonized pigs uh, that, uh, whose uh, uh, dermis uh, characteristics behave quite well, uh, quite well like humans. And finally, uh, we went into uh, the autoptic room, and it was one of the, my, uh, my, my uh, worst experiences in my life, and uh, to uh, deal with uh, very soft materials. And to, I mean, this is something that you, you should document. If you want to document a baby's brain, it was, uh, this was a six-month uh, baby, 
and uh, um, we wanted to scan this uh, brain and uh, uh, we succeeded in uh, doing it quite well so whenever you when as soon as you get your data in the computer you don't uh, have to uh, deal with the fact to handle it and to destroy its uh, uh, its morphology um, so uh, we had to do with uh, bone lesion this is uh, a uh, kind of a uh, set of cuts of uh, try, uh, I mean this, uh, the serial murder had to try to cut the bones and to, uh, to put the cadaver apart. And uh, so uh, most of the time uh, you need to know what is the weapon, what is the knife that has been used to do that. And three dimension is better than two to correlate uh, the uh, shape of the cut uh, with the shape of the weapon and uh, metrology also helps it uh, helps in this case as well uh, this was another murder guy with uh, you can see this uh, signs here and uh, uh, these signs have been done with uh, the tip of this uh, um, um, bar here and by scanning, by 3D scanning this kind of thing and 3D scanning this uh, arm, you could put them f virtually together in uh, the computer and see whether they could fit or not. So that is a good, a good way to assist the judge uh, um, uh, or the court uh, attempted to see where to demonstrate that uh, this guy was real guilty. Uh, as you can see here. Also for documentation, I mean, this is uh, um, the, an image of uh, a reconstructed uh, skull because it has been found in pieces uh, in, uh, um, below the, uh, the street and it has been patiently reconstructed by the, um, by the forensic med uh, med um, medical doctors and uh, the point is that if, if it is stays like this, it is very fragile. I mean, it just breaks it in pieces. So what we have done is we have uh, uh, reproducted it uh, with uh, uh, rendering and uh, then with uh, rapid prototyping for further study and storage. So when, when you have here, you have something that is uh, less than 100 microns different from the original stuff, but it is very solid and you can do what you want with that. So the conclusions are that 3D optical acquisition is feasible for the documentation of crime scenes, wounds and corpses. The technology is ready now. There are a number of um, uh, companies that manufactures, manufacture this kind of systems and uh, some are bought by the police in, in uh, the States or even in Europe. The market is ready, the investigators need it. Uh, the referability of measurements is crucial, Measure, me, me, uh, referability to standards and uh, uh, precise rules but uh, must be specified to avoid the operator manipulation of the models. So just a final Statement, what is uh, 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 around the corner? Um, I am pleased to know that in this Congress there are a little, um, at least a couple of presentations about cloud computing. Now, cloud computing or cloud imaging is uh, one of the um, points or the targets of uh, uh, imaging at the moment. Uh, so that uh, images will not store, will not be stored in the personal a personal computer or in a server, but if they will go somewhere in the, um, in the cloud and uh, uh, information will be accessible by a number of places for deconvolution, for uh, uh, information retrieval and for all the, per the, the information that would be needed to treat the data in a, pro uh, in a proper way. So I think I came to the, to the conclusion of my talk and uh, I um, think uh, on, on behalf of my wife and uh, myself, I thank you for your attention.